We had a full day of, of parallel sessions uh, yesterday, and one more round of parallel sessions uh, this morning. We we're already uh, nearing the end of this conference. Um, and for me, this conference again has, has shown that um, uh, lockdowns or distance learning or whatever is not always a bad thing, but uh, still can create very rich uh, exchange and, um, uh, and, and uh, learning events. Um, and I think this, this shows this again. Um, what I understood is that we have over 200 registered participants from 34 countries, uh, which all contributed to our discussions. And I think that's, that's really great. Um, but now we, we are ending towards, we're coming towards the end of the conference. Um, and, and in almost 50 different uh, uh, presentations, uh, topics regarding distance learning and teacher education have been uh, discussed and covered. Um, and some of these, most of them have been based on research. And, and some of that research has, is still in a rather uh, descriptive way to see, okay, what's happening? What do we know about uh, um, uh, how student teachers think, how teacher educators think, what are concerns, etc. But still, they're still very on the descriptive level. And, and the question I think that's, that we need to answer is to say, okay, but if we know now this, this, these descriptions of, of how things have worked or not worked, what actually is the implication for the future? I think that's also the key of the, 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 the aim of the teacher education policy in Europe network, the TEPI network, is not just to exchange uh, research projects and to say, well, okay, I've been in a very interesting conference and I give my presentation and I can put it in my CV, but to think about how do we, can we take all this input we have to improve teacher education? So actually, what's the implications for the practice in teacher education, for research in teacher education, and for policies in teacher education? And I think that's the aim of this, this um, uh, roundtable session, um, uh, to, to take a closer look in actual, what, what are the next steps? What can we learn from all our shared expertise, uh, uh, outcome of research projects, etc. So let me share my screen just to introduce this round table. Um, so what, what we the, the main theme of the conference was challenges of distance, te distance teaching and teacher education and education. Um, and it, we already started in, in, in April when we had a, a first webinar on uh, distance teaching and education, and then say, okay, what are the questions concerning teacher education that we can take up in this conference? Uh, and now we had a lot more detail about, well, what, what actually is, is our key issues in teacher education when we look at distance teaching or maybe em, 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 emergent distance teaching, because that was what happened uh, uh, from March, 2020. Um, so, I think if, if I look back at what happened um, from March 2020, then um, you could say that COVID-19 created an unprecedented and, and even unimagined disrupt, disruption of, I think, the whole society, the whole world, throughout the world, uh, without any preparation. Uh, we would have never imagined that we had to face social distancing, or, or as Michael Apple, uh, I think, correctly mentioned, phys physical distancing, um, that we had to, to, to cope with schools lockdowns. We couldn't have imagined that. Um, so everybody in their daily work was challenged. Um, um, and, and of course, we can talk about everything, but let's focus on teacher education. In teacher education, daily routines were, were challenged. And it's challenged at least in two ways. It, it was challenged in our understanding of what teaching in schools looks like and what is needed and what teachers need to offer the best possible support to pupils in schools, whether it's online or uh, whether it's offline in school buildings or also in the case when schools are locked down and, and, and uh, uh, things have to be done through distance learning. So we got a, 
we were confronted with a new understanding of what teaching in schools looks like and what teachers need. But at the same time, our, our own processes of teaching and learning within the teacher education curriculum was challenged. So our teacher education pedagogy, which was, is, was closed on closed interpersonal interaction between teacher educators, academics, and teacher students. And our understanding of that classroom teaching practice is a key part of the teacher education program and learning of students. And that was not possible or in a very limited way possible uh, uh, during the, uh, the COVID-19 lockdown. And on top of that, teachers, teacher educators, teacher education students, and actually everybody had to cope not only with those professional challenges, but also with personal challenges regarding health consult, consult, concerns, family loss, care for family members. And we had an uncertainty of how long the pandemic situation would last. I think in March 2020, we all were thinking, well, maybe after one month, we could open up the schools again. And now we're more than one year, one year uh, later. So that, that, that's the context where we've been working. Um, and, and maybe we can look back and, and say, okay, now we are more than one year further. If we look back, what do we know? What do we see? And probably would say, well, we did a very poor job with the knowledge we now have and looking back at what, what, what had happened and, and what we did and, and what we did not do. That we did a poor job or we could say well we did a fantastic job because we did our very best with full dedication to our responsibilities to our students schools and society given the uncertainty and time given all the personal tensions that were there i think teachers and teacher educators really did their very very best so i think teachers and teacher educators deserve a lot of empathy for all the effort they, they took to, to take on while well, they're challenged both in the content of teacher education and in the process of, 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 of teacher education curriculum. And they were challenged and they tried to do their best to, 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 keep that, um, uh, to keep up their work in the daily practice, although it was a completely different daily practice. So the question is, could we have done better? Well, I, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, given the fact that we, we were unprepared. But also the question is, can we do better next time? And I think that is only possible if we're able to learn from experience and build on this. So if we look into the future, then I think the, the, this, is, uh, this last question is the key question. Can we do better next time? And actually, what do we learn from the experiences we have? Um, and I think in that, the role of research is key. Um, and, and, and I am very, very impressed by all the research projects which have been carried out in the, in the past year. Some even in, in, in spring 2020 already, uh, where people look at what's happening and, and how can we make sense of what's, 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 what's happening and what can we learn from what's happening? And I think that that is really important. And, and I think with this conference, we brought all those expertise together. Uh, and that creates a possibility to try to answer th three key questions. A question about teacher education practice. What, teacher, what pedagogical strategies uh, uh, do, 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 we, do we need to meet and respond to challenges in distance education and learning within teacher education? And how can this be supported by research? What kind of teacher education policy do we need for the times we have entered? And the teacher education policy can be at the institutional level, at the national level, or at the European level. When I listened to, to, to the different uh, elements of the conference that I could, was able to participate in, I, I could see, well, there are a number of concerns and issues. And the concerns have to do with outcomes. And, and there's a lot of discussion in, in, I think, in different member states on, on the uh, learning outcomes of students in schools and, and how it's the inequalities in societies have actually been increased because of the lockdown in schools. I haven't heard so much about learning outcomes of student teachers, although in the final discussion we had just this morning, 
there was um, there were responses that maybe the learning outcomes of student teachers haven't suffered so much. But maybe the question is, but is that for everybody, or is there also a kind of inequality between student teachers? I'm not sure. I don't know. Second type of concern is to what extent. Um, um, do we answer the concerns of students and student teachers during distance learning? And do we focus only on the academic part of knowledge and skills? Or do we also uh, uh, take into account concerns of students and student teachers on uh, learning to be and learning to live together, social parts? The third element I see is what, concern, what are the concerns and needs of teachers and teacher educators in, in dealing with the lockdown and providing distance education? So what are, what are the concerns of teachers and teacher educators? And how to deal, and, and, and what does it require? It must be able to deal with the unexpected and to connect different actors. And I think, and I was very uh, pleased by a number of the presentations who really tried to look into the core of teacher education, into the black box, of distance learning practices and teacher education. So what design fix, uh, fits different students? What fits, what online uh, uh, activities fit to uh, which group of students and what on-site on, on activities? So who, uh, who benefits from which, which part of the curriculum? And what de designs fit which aim of the program? Because there's a difference between activities which focus on learning to know or learning to do, and activities which focus on learning to be and learning to live, live together. Some of these can be done very well, probably by distance learning. And for some of these, we really need to meet together to meet face to face. What would be the right balance? Well, for me, these are some of the concerns and issues. So, Let's try to make stock in a wider sense. And, and we've asked four experts um, to, um, to share their ideas with us and give a start of the, of the discussion that we have, can have in this session. The first one is Damian Stefan from the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. And as he's the host, uh, I will, he would, for me, would be the first one to invite to give his opinions. The second one is Hannah Granger, Granger Clemson, the uh, school policy officer the Director General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture from the European Commission. Um, the third one is Vasilias Simeonidis from the Carl Francis University of Graz, a member of the board of the Tepe. Of Tepe. And the fourth one is uh, Michael Apple, who um, did a kickoff of the conference with his keynote on Thursday, um, uh, addressing uh, important questions regarding um, inequality in society and how um, uh, the COVID crisis affected that. Um, I think about um, the, the, the design I, I was thinking about is having three steps. First, input from the panel. Then we would like to have input from the participants who will use Padlet for that. And then have an open discussion trying to connect the different pieces both with the panel members, but also with the other participants in the conference. So that is an introduction to our session. And I would like to give the floor first to Damian. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, of course, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, the invitation to participate in this um, round table. I am sorry that I could not attend uh, any of the previous uh, sessions of the conference uh, and uh, I have to apologize in advance uh, if you have uh, already discussed about some of the topics uh, that uh, I would like to mention in, in my speech now. I truly believe that, well, if ever this pandemic time showed us that we really do need to start some serious debate over the problem of, of technology, uh, particularly uh, computer-based uh, advanced uh, technology in, in education. So uh, if I use the well-known phrase now, we need to talk about technology in education. Uh, this area seems to be full of uh, paradoxes. I only have uh, about six minutes now, so let me just expose 
one of them. So one of the paradoxes that I that I see. Um, one of the main responses to this um, pandemic necessity of enforcing the usage of advanced uh, technologies in, in education was predominantly um, negative one. Over the year of this distance education and, and teaching in virtual spaces, we realized that um, such digitalization of teaching and learning cannot provide us with the same level of achievement of uh, curricular uh, goals and, and objectives. Even more, we claimed that certain educational goals simply could not be and cannot be achieved by teaching remotely in virtual environments. One of the most problematic consequences of such insight is the tendency to lower the knowledge standards set by national curricula and consequently to lower the educational expectations from, from students or vice versa. I could also say vice versa. So one of the consequences is, is to, to lower the expectations from students and consequently you know, to, to lower the, the knowledge standards set by, by national curricula. This process, as we can see, is often politically supported one because, well, if you are not able or willing to appropriately support and provide meaningful political measures to prevent the decrease of educational quality, you simply can declare that the knowledge standards set by national curricula do not need to be, to be achieved. Okay, we could also understand lower expectations under current uh, pandemic uh, circumstances if there would be any long-term compensation strategy in sight, but there isn't, at least not in, in Slovenia. Well, not only that we adjusted the, the knowledge expectations, assessment and grading this year, the problem we are dealing here is much, much bigger. Um, at the moment, uh, I happen to be a member of one national expert group, which is supposed to prepare the guidelines for the reform of national syllabi. So main national curriculum documents in Slovenia. And at our first meeting last week, we were asked to do a short brainstorming about what should these guidelines contain. And you can guess what was one of the first expert suggestions. Of course, we need to adjust the national curricula to the new pandemic reality. And of course, when speaking of adjusting the curricula in these circumstances, this hardly means rising the knowledge expectations or even keeping them at, at the same level. But, well, I promised at the beginning to expose the paradox. So where do I see it, this paradox? Well, if we are perceiving this experience of new technological reality as something insufficient, if we believe that school cannot perform its essential formative role by being technically and digitally enslaved, so to say. On the other hand, it took us only one year to fully accept this new educational reality and to perceive it as something for which there is no alternative anymore. Our political leaders, not only in Slovenia, but at least I can say at the level of, of European Union, are willing to support this new reality with great amounts of, of public funding. Only in Slovenia, the, the so-called plan for the recovery after pandemic anticipated more than, four, more than 400 million of euros to be invested directly or indirectly in projects related to digitalization of, of education. Digitalization is, as we can see, the new buzzword and, and a new mantra 
in Slovenian and of course in, in European educational policy as well. And it seems that we are all quite happy with it. We support it. We support it in the name of progress, of course, and we support it in the name of rationalization of educational processes. And this will inevitably lead to new forms of inequalities in the field of education. In my opinion, very, very soon, inequalities will not be that much related with disadvantaged experiencing, experiencing the lack of digital technology or, or access to computers, internet, and so on. As a society, we will take care of complete digitalization of, of our environments. What is going to happen is exactly what we are experiencing today when we are returning back to our physical university classrooms. Who is coming back to university after a whole year of using Zoom and, and Microsoft Teams? And how do so-called hybrid lectures look like? It is quite simple. Students who can afford to come and attend lectures live are in the classroom. Those living far away from university centers, those who need to work in order to survive, the poor and the disadvantaged students, they are with us remotely using the same technology we have provided them in order to allow them access to education during the, the pandemic. And the most concerning fact for me is that they are happy and they are grateful to have this opportunity to stay at their homes. And this is why I certainly need that. We, we, need, to, we need to talk about education, in, in, uh, about technology in education and about education in technology as well, yes. Thank you very much. I try to be as short as possible with my, with my input. It was perfectly in time in eight minutes, so that was good. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to share then the floor to uh, Facilis. Um, no, Hannah was the second one, sorry. Okay, thank you very much, um, Marco, and thank you to everyone. Um, having listened to um, some of your fascinating stories uh, in the past few days and, and some really, really interesting um, discussions um there are some actually some key things that have struck me um that i'm going to take away now before i was sucked into the uh dark policy world of legislation and meeting rooms um i was a theater and music teacher and i used a lot of observation in my research so i thought i would just share with you two images um as a way of uh illustrating um some of the things that i'd like to say now this first one is a photograph that was posted on Twitter um, this month by uh, Ms. Milam, who describes herself as a third grade teacher from Ohio in the United States. And as uh, teachers, teacher educators, education researchers, I'm sure um, you could deconstruct and discuss what is happening in this image for, for hours and you've possibly already focused in on something um, that interests you. Uh, the teacher says that um, she seems she's delighted that this, this boy has created a cozy atmosphere for reading his book whilst listening to something on his headphones um, in front of a, a virtual fire on his laptop. Um, and the reason, but the reason I chose this one was to raise my first point about uh, how we consider the future. Um, and this would be a question of how we can build through teacher education and other support, a broader and a better designed, um, as Marco said, blended learning in school education in a way in which all learners can benefit. And that's something that we, we've just heard um, as a question there. Uh, now we, as the European Commission, we've been consulting on this question with young people, teachers, and a whole range of education actors, including ministries for, for a year now. And what's emerged is that whilst a shared physical space for teachers and pupils to interact and learn is, is clearly crucial, the blend of different environments and tools is also important. And this doesn't mean 
using every space and every device in every lesson or course of study. But I think it does invite a rethinking of how learning experiences are designed and how they can perhaps be more flexible around individual learner needs and circumstances. And that, of course, is to uh, for advantage um, rather than creating more disadvantage. And it does mean building on the lessons learned regarding emote, uh, online remote learning we've been exploring in this conference. But I don't think but be not restricted by the notion of it's either in the school building or college or it's at home. Um, from our research evidence, from consultation, I think we need to consider shared space learning in other places. I mean, you can't see it in this picture, but we've got museums, forests, sports centres, factories, um, other places around the school as well as the classroom. And I think it should not. We should not only be thinking about personal digital devices and large smart boards, but paint brushes, um, stuff that goes bang in science lessons of mus musical instruments from different cultures and bearing this potential choice of environments and tools in mind one of the questions that also has struck me is of course there are serious implications now for how we develop practice through teacher education but I'm thinking also now after these days about professional identity um, I think with this what we've seen as a positive increase in autonomy uh, a range of possibilities of learning design. I think teachers need support to reflect on their own pedagogy, not just take the way of the textbook or the way they've been um, taught uh, to teach, um, but to really kind of find and rediscover some individuality, I think, in learning design and to be proud of and explore how they, um, you know, how they design learning um, as an individual teacher. My second image um, is taken from a survey that we conducted with European school children in March this year. Um, again, there's so much going on once you look closely, but whilst you are looking at it, I think it's worth mentioning that the teacher of this student is a member of eTwinning, which is our online community of European teachers. And it has been reported that these teachers who have been engaging in online professional development and in online project collaboration for a number of years were far more prepared for the shift than their peers. So anyway, back to this picture, knowing that a picture can paint a thousand words, what we were trying to do is to uh, dig a little deeper into how pupils say they would like to learn and their responses revealed, of course, a love of learning with each other. They liked the support of their teacher. They liked calm environments, busy interactive environments. They recognize they could chill out at home and their tv screens were perhaps bigger there were friends at school but also lots of books to carry um, but one thing that we noticed and that's why I chose this picture is that many chose to draw learning outdoors and other environments still with some desks or laptops in the picture but not the same classroom and school for them seems to be more than just the school buildings and I think this has policy implicate, you know, broad policy implications. If systems are committed to supporting collaboration with the school and the wider community, um, and this is not just to expand the access to environments and tools, but also the expertise um, that perhaps have been, you know, blocked out for for the past year and need to be brought closer. The other learning facilitators that teachers might work with in their career, the artists, the scientists, the designers, the computer programmers. And I'm wondering how teacher education can maybe better prepare for these effective community partnerships in their programs. And just to finish off, um, as a final idea that I was thinking of this just this morning, I've been really struck by this notion of being present. Um, we've talked about the importance of teachers and pupils connecting a shared space, teacher educators and their student teachers. Um, listening to your own research, I'm really thinking now more about the teacher as a researcher and a reflective practitioner um, and where so much is being developed at a rapid pace um, at the moment in in all these different schools um, across Europe, across the world, I sense that more than ever, 
finding ways through research to capture teachers' own reflections, experiences, and observations. And the real minutiae of learning is what is most needed to be brought to the surface for policy making. I don't think it's the sole responsibility of teacher education to do to build that culture, but it's certainly something that's on my mind. Um, so thank you very much and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Marco, we can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, well, thank you, Hannah, for uh, co your contribution, uh, connecting it to the European policy agenda, but also highlighting some of the key elements that you, you identify uh, in your presentation. Um, the third one would be uh, Fasilis. Floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Marco. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is uh, Vasilis Simonidis. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Empirical Education Unit at the University of Graz. And I have been researching issues of Europeanization in teacher education policy and practice. I'm very glad uh, to be here with you and to have been invited to participate virtually in this panel discussion next to uh, uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, including also Michael Apple, whose uh, work uh, I remember I was required and had the pleasure to study as part of my teacher education program uh, studies in, in Greece. Uh, I think that the TEFE conference has so far been an excellent opportunity uh, to discuss and learn from the experience of each other about the impact of COVID pandemic on teacher education policy and practice. I personally had the chance to chair uh, two very interesting sessions where we discussed the various challenges brought up by the COVID pandemic, including on teachers' well being, on their professional status, and their professional development opportunities. Uh, we also discussed about pedagogical strategies implemented in different contexts to teach subjects such as mathematics and language through distance teaching and the effect that this distance uh, teaching has for children with uh, disabilities. I can report that all uh, presentations uh, were of high quality and contributed to gaining some new insights about the future of teacher education policy and practice in Europe. So I would like to briefly refer to the notes that I took during the conference, as well as on some of my own reflections. And I will do so particularly for themes uh, two and four of the conference, namely practice and policy of teacher education since I have been sharing sessions and contributing with um, presentations to the specific themes. Uh, with regard to uh, the second theme of pedagogical strategies to meet and respond to challenges in distance teaching and learning, presenters uh, raised uh, the need for personalized and self-regulated learning, which can be promoted through various methods, as uh, some of the ones um, that were communicated uh, in the sessions I was involved were inquiry-based approaches, project-related methods, uh, scaffolding, um, and it was therefore suggested that uh, professional development opportunities that are relevant to promote this uh, personalized uh, learning for, for teachers that may also take place uh, virtually and have also been taking place virtually in, in different contexts can better prepare teachers to include diversified practices in their teaching to support students with special needs and students coming uh, from low socioeconomic uh, background. Um, and we had empirical evidence uh, today from a very interesting study coming from Greece uh, and also from uh, Spain that uh, uh, this uh, would be possible and it is uh, a thing to do. Uh, the second uh, key message, so to say, is um, to adopt distance learning solutions that build on the technology that exists um, this was raised by colleagues who presented the situation also in uh, less developed economies. Sometimes it seems that the best technology uh, is the one that we already have and we know how to use and we can afford, like for example, 
uh, the mobile phone, uh, and it is anyway the content that matters rather, rather than the, the container. So our focus should be on, on the actions uh, that technological devices enable rather than the devices themselves. Of course, that being said, uh, at the same time, the relevant stakeholders need to try to improve digital infrastructures in, in schools, but it becomes more clear that in some contexts, this is more of a wishful thinking than, than a possible uh, uh, reality, and several contextual factors uh, uh, influence, influence that. Uh, last but not least, uh, maintaining positive relations and communication with um, families uh, is essential, especially when it comes to distance learning. It has been argued that teachers need to work with school districts, need to work with families to figure out the best platform and format for checking in regularly about students' uh, progress. Uh, we had evidence presented from uh, teams and peers, uh, large-scale assessments showing that because many students in primary school education are not reaching the expected uh, reading levels necessary for independent learning, parents are crucial uh, in, this, in this learning process, play a very important role, and even more so when it comes to distance education. With regard to the, uh, the uh, fourth theme of the conference about teacher education policy for the future, uh, discussions during the sessions I was involved resulted in some ideas, which I have noted uh, down here, and you can see. The first is about um, developing policies guided by teachers, since they are the ones directly involved in the challenges of distance education. Such policies can improve the sense of ownership for teachers and make the policy enacting process relevant for the practice and the reality of teachers. An important challenge also mentioned in the sessions uh, I attended relates to teacher educators, a uh, uh, very important role, uh, but also the fact that they, they, that they lack experience and skills on online teaching and they uh, sometimes face difficulty to establish online collaborative learning opportunities for student teachers. So in that sense, supporting teacher educators professional development can encourage them to reconsider how new forms of, of practice and teaching theories can be woven together more effectively in post-COVID teacher education. The pandemic has also exacerbated a discussion that has been going on uh, in teacher education about uh, standardizing teacher education curricula on one hand based on research evidence and based on this learning outcomes approach, while at the same time envisaging to develop the agency and autonomy of student teachers, involving them in the design and delivery of teacher education programs. There are currently interesting initiatives, such as the design of a teacher education curriculum in the Netherlands presented that involves student teachers in the decision-making process which can strengthen the democratic agency of future teachers, improve their engagement, and place the pedagogical component at the center of initial teacher education. And the final aspect which I wanted to mention is more related to the European Union level and suggests moving beyond a mere skills and competency-based approach when it comes to developing European education policy and rather consider a more social and ethically responsive approach to education that can indeed contribute to social fairness. Considering the European pillar of social rights developed in 2017 and the establishment of the European education area that is envisaged for 2025 to enable policy, uh, bigger policy co cooperation among member states, the COVID-19 pandemic could be considered an opportunity to rethink the education political project uh, in the direction of a new social Europe, where the fabrication of a European space of education plays a decisive role. Concepts such as Bildung, the German ideal, and Pedia, the Greek notion, offer a powerful ethical framework and could serve as a resource to reinvigorate the common cultural heritage and reinforcing also European identity. 
So the lessons to be learned from a systemic crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic should also be themselves radical and systemic. It is unlikely in my view that we will go back to normal, uh, what is normal anyway, and teacher education should try to adapt quicker to social realities that are uh, constantly changing. We know that teacher education is an area deeply rooted in a way in national conditions, uh, but we have seen that schools nowadays and, and teachers have quickly adapted and adapted faster to, 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 to this reality of disruption. And we have examples, for example, from the German School Award, etc., cetera, uh, that show the innovative potential uh, that, that, that schools have undertaken. And in that sense, teacher education should try to cope with those changes so that it doesn't become obsolete, it doesn't become irrelevant for teachers and for their uh, professional realities. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Vasilis, with your uh, systematic approach of, of the, the, the questions that we have addressed. Um, um, and finally, the, uh, the floor is to Michael Apple, and I'm very happy that you're here, uh, realizing that probably at your place it's five o'clock in the morning or something. Um, so I'm grateful that you're happy to join us uh, after delivering your keynote last Thursday, and we're looking forward to your opinions. Michael. Thank you. Uh, let me begin first with an apology. There were technical difficulties. It's four o'clock in the morning here. Um, so thank you for your op the opportunity to get up just a little earlier. Um, but uh, again, uh, luckily, Paula uh, sent me a, an alternative link for me to get on. So it's been a bit of a struggle to do that. Um, I want to uh, reflect a bit on what it means to step back and see the larger picture. Um, I want to talk about pedagogic strategies, but not in schools. That is what I think becomes important in many ways, is to understand uh, what the right has done socially and to look at a different kind of pedagogy. That is, what is the role of what we, the technologies and processes of distance learning and distance education uh, in what I want to call public pedagogy? That is, what is the role in trying to interrupt the kinds of policies and practices that make it very, very difficult for some of the brilliant ideas that have been expressed in teacher education and elsewhere, uh, that, that makes it very, very hard for them to get traction. And unfortunately, the landscape of education is littered with the bodies of failed progressive reforms. I don't like that as a person who spent many years as a teacher and administrator in public schools, it hurts me in some ways, as I think it does for many of us, that many of the things we are trying to do have a half-life that is much shorter than we would like. So I wanna start out with a question about what is the right done? How is it engaged in a creative social pedagogy to convince people to come under their leadership in ways that make it much more difficult for us to have the resources and power to engage in the kind of things that have been so visible, both in the responses so far in this, uh, this interactive seminar, but also in the seminar as a whole. So what can we learn from the right about a public pedagogy? What is our role in convincing people to support more progressive policies around education so that distance learning doesn't fall into the kinds of social approaches um, that I try to warn us about, and as many other people in this entire conference have tried to warn us about uh, on the first day and the second day. Um, again, the, in, essence, in essence, the question is, what is the role of what we might call public intellectual work, or what I call in Can Education Change Society, the role of the critical scholar activist, whose role is not simply, and I don't mean to minimize this, not simply working in institutions of education, but seeing the public sphere as an educational site for the kinds of work we need to do. So I want to tell the story of what we have called the Critical Media Project, in which teacher educators and other people play a significant role. But many of us in the United States, and this we are now working in Brazil and elsewhere, have been strongly, strongly uh, affected by the effectiveness 
of the messages of the right? How is it that people get pulled under their leadership? And that to me is one of the most fundamental questions we can ask. And for many of us, what becomes clear is that they have seen the public sphere as an education site. And they will use media, social networks, um, uh, podcasts, all kinds of things that many of us are quite skilled at um, to pull people to do this, to say you have a choice of umbrellas to get out of the rain in education. Um, Come under hours rather than mark. Um, So I have spent, and not just me, but many, many people internationally have spent years writing and thinking about and doing practice to try and interrupt those messages. So let me tell you about something that we have developed and the way it has worked. I don't want to be romantic about this. There have been problems with it, but let me at least lay it out. It's what we call the critical media project. If we can think about what the right is doing, It sends messages in robustly interesting language. You will never hear a quote from Foucault in their presentations or from Gramsci or from many of the people uh, who give us uh, a semblance of sanity during these difficult times. But you will find a sort of faux populism, a populist message that I think resonates very, very powerfully with people. I think now of Hungary, of um, even Slovenia with its current uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, all of these now have been very strongly influenced by a rightist pedagogic process of populist forms. So the critical media project says, how do we respond to this? And it examines what are the ways in which the right then sends messages of, that, that seem to be compelling to millions and millions of people What are the sites of doing this? And they can range from op-ed pages uh, in in national newspapers, the news, national and local, and even in the United States, what are called weekly shoppers. These are free newspapers that in London, when you go on the tube, when the tube was working, you'd be handing, you'd get them for free. Uh, So... So what we have tried to look, do is to look at the messages that they are sending and to make a commitment, no matter what, appropriate to the level of the media presentation that's going on, this, in quotes, distance pedagogy that's going on, uh, we will respond. So I'll give one example. Um, in policy and curriculum studies, uh, that is one of my, my roles. That is, there's now 150 to 200 union leaders, public intellectuals, teacher educators, educational researchers, government officials, who have made a promise, a vow, that says the following. When something comes up, is published in our area, let us say it's a, local, it's a national newspaper um, that has something on teacher education, and right now in a number of nations, as I mentioned the other day, um, there are pressures to close teacher education programs. So the fastest growing teacher education program in the United States does not occur at teacher education institutions for more than eight weeks. It is called Teach for America. It's Teach Teach China. It is all over the world. And you get eight, uh, eight weeks of teacher education and you're thrown into the most difficult classrooms in the most difficult and impoverished areas. So let us pretend that that comes up. One of our fellows, and it's an honorary position, if this is simply an op-ed piece, you know, 1,000 word piece in a newspaper, has three days to write a response, period. Three days, you must give up all the deadlines that you have that a journal has said, in order to publish this, we need your edits in three days. You must promise that you will not, that you will turn only to this interruptive strategy, and you will write something immediately in response in the language that is appropriate to that. Now that takes us, brings up a personal responsibility. Many of us are very, very talented at writing academically. Now as a former union organizer, I used to have the ability to speak populist forms. I've lost some of that in many ways. So I must relearn how to be responsive 
to a multiplicity of audiences that are appropriate to this message. Uh, another example might be in a local informal news, newsletter that one would pick up as you're getting into a subway or as you're, getting, uh, as you're going shopping. And in many, many nations, there are sort of adver advertisements with editorials, these five to six page newsletters that you would pick up for free in a supermarket. And uh, if the message is uh, trashing teachers, and many of these are very right-wing, owned by right-wing corporations, uh, then my role would be to write a response immediately. Now, this is a very complicated situation because many of us who are quite skilled academics have again lost the skills of responsiveness. So the right has been able to have professional journalists and in Washington think tanks in the United States, they are paid 150,000 US dollars to take right, rightist forms and attacks and put them in ways that are very popular. So we, have, we do not have $150,000 to hire critical journalists, but we do have fellowships at universities that can bring in critical journalists and say, as part of your study for your master's degree or for a certificate, we will pay for you. We will give you a living wage, a small one, and we will pay your fees at the university so you get something out of this. And they will take Michael Apple's language or many, many, you know, 150 other people's language and rewrite it, send it back. And then within a day, we send the edited copy back. The rights, what we might call hit list, meaning its publication rate is about 90% when they send things out. Our rate right now is 47% in our response. I assure you that is, while it's only half of what is necessary, it is still better than zero. And in the research we've done on the response, on responding to rightist forms, we are not very good at doing that. So part of the things I want to point to then in closing is that we stress not, not only, and again, that's not to minimize it, not only the work that we do in schools and with schools, but to say, what is our role as public intellectuals when we understand what the right has done in colonize this, colonizing the space of distance education for the public itself. Uh, I'm pleased to say that this is still going on. I'm not pleased to say that the pressure on me and all of us as colleagues and workers in education is unbelievably intense now. There is never time, as we'll say, we didn't have time to go to the toilet. This is, this is the life right now that many of us are leaving, reading. But if we wish to interrupt those people who have increasing power, we must also take on the role of seeing a public pedagogy as part of our responsibility. So those are the comments I have in my reflection. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for uh, uh, well, your call uh, for awareness uh, within teacher education and, and the whole discussion on, on, on blended learning and the role of technology. And um, we had four different responses, uh, but at the same time, I think they, they connect more or less to each other. Um, I think it, we, we started with uh, Damien's uh, call to, to question the role of technology uh, and, and the way it might, might lead to inequalities. Um, for me, that, that also raises the question actually, well, as, as Damien mentioned, that technology might not reach to the same level of achievement. For me, the question is, but is that because of technology, or is that because of the way we, uh, we use technology? Uh, that was supported very much by, uh, by Hannah, uh, who, who actually called for designing rich learning environments, which go beyond the, the dichotomy of on-site and online. So school, in school or online, because she mentioned, well, there's much more than just school and, and computer, where we can, we can create uh, um, uh, rich learning environments. Uh, and that we need to, in, in designing our learning environments, to be adaptive to learning needs. Um, 
I think that was taken up by, by Facilis to say, well, what we actually need is to strengthen the autonomy and agency of teachers and learners. Um, and, and actually, in, uh, on the one hand, in designing curricula, but on the other hand, in also thinking about policies. And then we move from practice into policy at, um, um, at the institutional level to, to it, what the call was to create communities with a variety of actors um, and on a national level to involve teachers and teacher educators. Um, and at the European level, there was Hannah again to think about well, how can universities work together, for example, in a European uh, university network um, and to um, uh, facilitate call to, to, to think also about a more strong social and ethical perspective in teacher education. And then there was the warning from Michael, well, if we are developing into a stronger role of technology, so we connected very much to Damian's uh, presentation, then the question was, but do we realize what the impact might be because of the role of economy and technology and the fact that education becomes open for any company or enterprise to take on uh, uh, education? So what's the real role of critical schoolers in this? Uh, and I think that's a, 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 that, that, that wide perspective. On the one hand, what about practice? What about policy? And what about the warnings that we need to be aware of in our work? What I would like to do now is to invite you to give your ideas. What, what, what would be the implications uh, for, um, teacher education, for teacher education practice, for teacher education research, and teacher education policy? So to bring some more input into our discussion. Um, so I would like to invite you to um, uh, take a look at the Padlet, which is put in the link um, and to see whether you can add some elements on it. Um, let's share the screen and you can see the idea. Um, and that is to add what are your elements that you think, well, if we talk about challenges and implications, what do I think about teacher education practice, teacher education policy, and teacher education research. So if you go to that Padlet page, I would like to invite you to join in and put your inputs and ideas on it. Um, and then we can bring it up for discussion. So I give you everybody some time to bring in their ideas.
Well, I would look, still like to invite people to keep posting on the Padlet page. Um, I would like to first to ask um, Damian, Hannah, Vasilis, Michael, to respond maybe on something or some of the other panel members have had put forward or maybe something you read on the Padlet. Um, what strikes you? Where do you see connections? Where do you see fundamental differences? Who would like to respond of the four of you? I'm happy to uh, respond initially. Um, it was yes. something that uh, I think it's from uh, something that we were all thinking about. And as you said, is the purpose of this um, panel. But it's particularly something I think that Michael was saying about the narrative that's been created around what we are all trying to do and um, what what we are sensing is that there is not necessarily a tension but a preference for immediate response even now um, compared to long-term planning preparation um, why, why are we shifting our practice? Why are we uh, looking at things in different ways? It is no longer, as you said last year, um, it isn't an emergency response anymore. We are more informed, um, as Damien said, I think. And it, but it's still, I think, what's politically sexy if we can put it in a certain way, and I don't know, Michael, if you'd agree, to say, for a politician, of course, to say, we're doing this immediately for, for the learners because of their immediate needs, and this is, this is, and we can show immediate impact. But I think what we're talking about is shifting practice for the longer-term benefits of education. Now, it might be that those are similar approaches and that you could argue that the way in which you want to take teacher education, the different kinds of courses you can offer, the kind of content, what, what you're striving to achieve um, to support teachers is, yeah, yeah, it is the same as you would take now as you would take in the future, but the way it is framed um, in order to get that message out to to take back control of the education narrative if we feel it's being threatened. Um, I'm not sure I have a solution of how to do it, but it's something that I sense is that we're surrounded by and perhaps because I'm um, in, in the midst of a, the sort of policy development. I'm not sure what the other the panelists think about that. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, it, it was, um, my intention actually to um, bring forward the question that, um, or to bring forward that we need to ask some questions that I think uh, have not been asked yet. And that is, you know, what, what kind of um, formative role do we expect from school in in this, let, let's say, digitalized environments. I don't want to be, you know, um, I, I don't want to oppose the digitalization as such. It is part of our realities, of course. I mean, we, we are all living in a world which is increasingly digitalized. And I don't expect school to go back to 19th century and to all those ideals of building and, and you know, the, the ideals that were, well, ideals back then. But I think we did not answer ourselves. What do, what do we expect from school? Well, what kind of human beings do we expect school to form? This is the main question that we have to ask ourselves, because if we do not ask this question, then of course, this digitalization can be, well, even much more an ideological agenda than it already is. So this is one of the main problems that we are dealing with in, in this area. And um, I just want to, to do a quick reply to, to that um, autonomy issue. For me, autonomy 
in the area of education. And uh, well, I do, I do not oppose autonomy uh, as well. But for me, this, this, the concept of autonomy is one of the most abused concepts in the, well, educational policy. In Slovenia, well, whenever the political decision makers didn't want to invest significant, well, let's say funding into improving education at the state level, they simply declared that, well, a part of the, well, let's say uh, decisions can be autonomous decisions of, the, of, of schools, of teachers, and so on. And this is, it is a perfect way how to actually, you know, give up your responsibility as a decision maker at the national level and just grant the autonomy to, to the school leaders and, and to teachers without providing the means that they could actually decide professionally to make professional decisions, but th they are forced to make decisions in the context that they actually have to work, work within. So th that's why I'm saying that we have to be very, very careful. Yes, we can foresee the lowering of the knowledge standards. It is a fact. And if we don't do anything against that, we will actually wake up in a very different reality than, than, than we think we live in today. So that, that's all that I wanted to, to, to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, maybe Facilis or Michael, but also I would like to invite the other participants to join in the discussion or maybe to respond on some of the elements which are placed on the Padlet. Lydia, uh, please turn on your microphone. Okay, thank yes. you very much for uh, this opportunity to share my ideas. Uh, I see all those things connected together. That means teacher practice, teacher policy, and teacher research. But I will start from research. Uh, because um, if we research and if we are such a uh, practitioner uh, that based our work in everyday life in research and in reflective research, we will understand what's going on in the, the best way. And to build such... Um, how to say, sustainable policy for education, we need to um, see very carefully what implication our research has in uh, the way uh, that we would like to uh, build our policy in education. Um, but I understand um, um, looking several research today and yesterday, and um, I, I was very inspired from uh, everyone's work, and I was so impressed for um, in, in this, uh, in particular, in um, methods that each of us uh, is used, has used. And uh, I have an idea to join forces in research with the same topic, because um, if, uh, if I work um, in my team and find a methodology or an approach, uh, it is good, very good, uh, and good enough maybe uh, in some circumstances, but we have opportunity to work together and to um, make a better work in aspect of um, uh, methodolo methodological approach. Because if we find the right way to measure things and uh, to be very specific in some aspect of doing things, I think it will be more worthy in uh, research uh, value. That means based on those uh, findings 
that we are able to gain from this uh, calibrated research, let's say, we will look very carefully what's going on in our practice and what kind of policy is, is suitable for each of us based on circumstances. That means we are able to discuss more openly and to disseminate uh, in several countries our uh, findings and find the best solution for each uh, place, for each uh, environment, and to discuss with each other uh, in which way we will, would like to, uh, to direct our, um, our education and what policy it's more beneficial for each one. Thank you. And, Thank you, Alaya. Yeah. Thank um, you so much. And then from, from the responses, I, I think there are, for me, two elements. And, and one is to, to, to uh, make much more explicit what underlying uh, meanings, under, underlying pressures, under, underlying uh, uh, developments uh, are guiding our policies or practices and to make that make to be much more aware of these um, so that's and, and one way is, is to bring together um, the, the, the critical research from different and the cri critical uh, academics from different universities in, in joint projects the other thing is that um, and, and that's also something which is mentioned quite a number of times at the padlet is uh, the need to open up uh, practice within teacher education and, yeah. and 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 when I look at what's on the Padlet Act that opening up is, is mentioned in two ways one is to open up practice and the black box within teacher education and yeah. the other way of opening up is opening up in terms of institutions and to take to 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 join in discussions with other stakeholders uh, beyond our own institution and not just to to think within our own closed environments. Maybe some of you have some responses. Sorry, uh, that, that, that sorry one more up. time, if I can say something. Something that we miss so much in this period of pandemic, it is a connection with each other. That means uh, to share ideas, to share our thoughts, to discuss about uh, profound things. And if we work together, we can share it. Even yeah. though that we are uh, today online, we are thinking a lot of um, so, uh, about solution and in which direction we should go uh, from now. And yeah. Uh, let's, see, yeah. let's see what let's see what other thinks about this. Yes, so thank anyone you very else much. who would like to respond to this? I would like to follow up perhaps what Marco said about opening up teacher education and I would totally, uh, I mean, I agree with this comment. The thing is that we know from research that teacher education is an overly fragmented area in higher education uh, landscape. So there has to be ways to be able to communicate, to network, to collaborate as teacher educators. And there have been many initiatives uh, developed at a local level, at national level with associations, etc. And we saw also from the uh, discussions about the need to further professionalize teacher educator so i think we should be moving towards that direction and one uh, uh comment in the padlet was that many of those uh, ideas are not really new and that we already know them since many years but that's the thing uh, many researchers point out that uh, the covid pandemic can be seen as an opportunity uh, of the century, some people say, to, 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 to change things. The thing is, there are many of this kind of, of, of disruptions, and we should be find a, finding a way to make teacher education more adaptable to this kind of disruptions, to be able to utilize the innovations that happen on the ground, on the schools, at the level of the teacher, make it more receptive in that sense to the actual needs of the teacher, to the actual needs of societies. But that means, in a way, uh, overcoming this fragmentation and, and enabling uh, school-university partnerships and, and, and bringing, opening up teacher education. 
uh, like like you, Marco, uh, pointed out correctly. So that's my comment. Could you identify what what steps we need to take to to create that opening up? I mean, this is, uh, and, and I have seen uh, uh, many times uh, also promoted in European policy documents this idea of, um, yeah, well, supporting teacher educators in a way to, first of all, uh, promote their uh, networking, promote their professional identity. I mean, this is a task of us as researchers to kind of work on this kind of topic, to research, to, to bring them into the light uh, uh, um, and start uh, collaborating, start networking so that we can uh, see in the different also higher education context actually uh, yeah, overcoming this this uh, this fragmentation. I mean, uh, I think also with your initiative that you described about this curriculum in the Netherlands and where you also try to involve students and also other uh, de other departments, the subject, the the, the didactics together uh, in in this common uh, teacher education process, so have this more collaborative approach would be one way to also open up uh, teacher education. Another thing would be to promote the school university uh, partnership. So to, to, to really engage with schools uh, in meaningful ways. Uh, and, and we have example also in a project I have involved and I can also post in the chat, the European doctorate in teacher education, where we have documented best practices. So to say how this can be done. So these are just some initial ideas from my side. Yeah. Thank you, Vasilis. Um, I think we, we had a number of responses from people from Europe, from Michael, from the US. Uh, in the chat, I also see a reaction from Dr. Mabel Idika from the University of Ibadan in uh, Nigeria. Would you like to comment maybe on the comment you made in the, um, uh, in the chat and to offer your perspective from, from Africa? Dr. Mabel Idika. Maybe there's no microphone available. Okay, then. Anyone else would like to respond to the challenges we have as teacher educators? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm pushing a bit because I, th I think it's important to try to bring together all the different uh, uh, ideas and opinions on, 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 the, on this topic. Um, and to try to summarize that in a final statement after the conference. So these are the topics that we, we think are important for teacher education but also maybe to set an agenda for the teacher education policy in Europe network and to say, okay, but it's, it's, of course it's, it's ambitious and it's good to, to connect and to meet each other, for example, in this conference. But if we really want to influence the policy agenda, then we need to, to come to conclusions and say, okay, this is what the key is of teacher education also in pandemic times. And this is what we need to take care of um, in further developments in teacher education. Um, and that could also be themes that we want to pick up if, in next webinars uh, where we can go more into depth in a specific sub subject. So from that perspective, I would like to invite you very much to say, okay, what actually would be an act, an, a, a concrete step forward that we can take either as individual teacher educators, as institutions, or within European networks. Pavel? Yeah, uh, there was quite a lot of uh, interesting discussion already. So it's uh, not easy to give something new. Uh, nevertheless, um, I think, at least sometimes, that teacher education institutions look too much into only two directions. One of them is future teachers in service, as well as uh, uh, pre-service, as well as in service with, with uh, teachers in schools. 
and the other one is, uh, let's say, academic. Uh, but within uh, uh, higher education, uh, over the last years, there is more and more discussion about the third university mission. And in some disciplines, they take it quite seriously. Uh, in particular, this is the question of uh, collaboration with the local communities, with communities around you. Uh, this is in, in, in some universities in North America, we can see that. And this is not so much popular in Europe. Uh, we talk too much about collaboration with economy, but not with communities. And simply, I have, uh, I have a strange feeling that, uh, that uh, in particular teacher education institutions do not see communities as an important uh, forum with, with whom they have to collaborate. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, uh, what, what uh, uh, Michael and uh, Damian uh, said earlier today, this is important here. I mean, if uh, 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 the discussion about, for example, about, about uh, the, the level of knowledge should not be only discussion within experts and between teacher educators and teachers in schools. This is an issue of utmost importance for the society. So we experts from the field should share their knowledge with parents. Not all of them are under populist influence. And many of them would be happy to receive, let's say, uh, 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 correct information. Uh, so that's one of the, point, well, of, of the points I would put on the agenda. So the third mission of the teacher education institutions and uh, uh, activism in that sense. Um, unmute, Mark. Yeah, actually, it's a call for university to get out of their ivory tower, and maybe not only to to send our expertise to the local communities, but also to listen to the local communities about their practical knowledge and expertise, and 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 also their needs. So, thank you very much, Michael. Am I correct that you raised your hand to respond? Yeah, in some ways, one of the major points that I wanted to make has now been, I think, very articulately made by Paula, but um, there are models of doing this, that is collaboration with communities, to me, is absolutely central. But the models that are going on in some places around women's studies or indigenous studies, or even in the governance of uh, academic institutions, um, that some of the leaders in the communities and activists in the communities have a place, a formal place within the decision-making of teacher education programs. So a good example would be the University of British Columbia uh, in Canada, in which in the Indigenous Studies program, the elders and leaders of Indigenous communities who care so much about their history and knowledge and about their children have formal formal mechanisms where they participate fully in what the curriculum should look like, what should teachers know. So I think we're not starting something uh, that's not been done before, but sometimes we look within ourselves about this and there are models out there. Uh, so I would urge us to look at some, some of the history of women's studies programs or indigenous studies programs for, for some insight into what can go on. Thank you, Michael, for again uh, providing a very clear example, which, which uh, can inspire us. Anna, you want to respond too? Yes, it was it was it was along it was along the same lines um, uh, of uh, what Pavel was saying and, and Michael was saying, and I, I think that that's something certainly that higher education institutions can do to 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 bridge. Um, with communities. I know also uh, Monash in Australia, again, has a very strong um, Indigenous community um, programme. Um, I was also then thinking that I, that this needs also uh, to work at the policy level. An example 
uh, from Ireland. And I know Latvia and Norway are taking a similar approach where they, as, as ministries, are coming together between education and culture, putting funding in, but also giving training to um, uh, cultural practitioners to understand what education, what school education is trying to achieve, how it is structured, so that those partnerships can be longer lasting and they have a, those actual, um, the individuals have a better understanding. Now, Michael, you were talking about um, teach, teach for All and the very, very short, compressed um, education courses that we understand they need to be longer for those who are going to be working daily in schools. But for these others, I see a possibility if um, if teacher education can be funded, supported with policy to open itself up and invite in um, for structured um, for structured learning, structured training to these different uh, community uh, cultural practitioners. I think that can also help because they really do need to understand, and it's otherwise it will just be up to the teacher and somebody that they know in the local community to try and explain everything that's developed over years of years of practice. Um, and I know sometimes you can talk about building a bridge, but that still means you go outside of education, outside of culture to meet somewhere in the middle. And when we say opening up, I think we need to maybe also bring them in to education to work with us as a community. Um, sorry, that's quite abstract, but I'm sort of trying to um, give, give this. There are concrete examples in countries yeah. of policies that have done that, but I think it is yeah. something to keep. And I think that, that for me is the power of the European collaboration uh, within yeah. a network like TEPE and within the European Commission is to look at different examples in different countries uh, and, and to find inspiration and to, 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 to see what kind of connections can, that can be made. Um, I would like once again try to uh, connect with uh, uh, Dr. Mabel Ideka from uh, Nigeria. Uh, there was a problem with um, the communication, but I think that should be solved now. So I would very much like to hear your ideas and maybe also some inspiring examples from the African, com African context. Okay. Hello. Hi. Okay, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good uh, morning, everyone. Yeah, sorry, it's um, a bit dark. I don't know if you can see me. <laughs> yes, yes, we can. It, it's part of the African problem. <laughs> Actually, there's no power. <laughs> <laughs> There's no power right now. I just want to thank, um, just want to say I'm so happy and um, uh, thankful to be part of this um, great um, symposium or conference. I actually got the, um, the information through a mentor and um, a great, uh, one of our scholars in the Department of Science and Technology Education, and that's um, Dr. Adedeji Tella. He sent me the link and I believe I should be part of this discourse. It's been quite an ex um, interesting experience. Um, you know, it's given me a framework to mirror or to examine our own situation in Africa, especially in Nigeria. So I'm, I'm a, a lecturer of um, chemistry education in the University of Ibadan. So we basically prepare teachers to teach chemistry, um, to teach science, and then mine is chemistry. So I teach teaching, um, I teach chemistry methodology, chemistry methods. So it's been quite interesting. And um, obviously I, from this conference, I've learned a lot. That's basically what it is for me. It's been a journey of learning and a great experience. So. Um, part of, we, we have a lot of challenges right here. It's not as, this place is not as um, advanced as the EU, uh, but um, I believe that we, we have we have a lot of challenges, of course, um, if I yeah. want to mention a few, um, so the one you're experiencing. We're, but we're coming to the um, uh, end of the time slot for this conference, but I, I would like to invite you to, 
um, to give two comments maybe. And, and if you look at the conference, what is the message that, that you take with you to your colleagues yeah. at your university? And what is the message right. you want to give to us to take with us? Right. Okay, so um, I, I, I've learned from this conference that it's that collaboration is important, collaboration and sharing of ideas across um, across scholars, as, across researchers, and um, this could help us uh, contextualize our own practices and our own policy. You guys over there, I would want some more or same thing like collaboration with us. I believe that um, it, it, we may not be as um, on a high standard as you guys are, but I believe there are certain things you may learn from us, such as our cultural perspectives and um, Teachers, despite the, for instance, during the COVID, uh, in my university, we had to run what we call the emergency remote teaching. I was a departmental representative and um, we ran this program without funds. The, the commitment and the, the, the dedication and the devotion of the lecturers here are quite uh, remarkable and laudable. We, we did not receive a, a simple, single cent from the from the government to facilitate the program but we ran through the so i think um maybe that way that is some aspect where the eu you guys can also learn from us to be okay. dogged yes. <laughs> thank you very much and i think that, that thank indeed, you so much yeah that indeed is, is an important message that well we're talking always talking about money 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 but i think it is the main thing is dedication and of course, there, right. there need to be conditions and it isn't important to be successful, but I think it's right. not all with the dedication of teachers and teacher educate, educators. Thank you very right. much. I would Thank like you. To, to conclude our um, um, uh, roundtable discussion. And, and lots have been said. I will not try to summarize it all. I try to, to pick out and pinpoint some elements uh, during the discussion. Uh, I think we'll still um, take, we'll take time to bring all those elements that were um, uh, put forward. We have the um, recordings of it and to see what kind of key, key messages come out. Um, and, and for me, the, um, the, 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 the nice thing is that I don't have to try to make a summary of the whole conference because Eva will try to do that. So I will try, I will now give the floor to Eva to come to, uh, to, to um, for the concluding session of this whole conference. Eva, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And um, yeah, this morning already has been so rich and, and um, all discussions have been very inspiring. <laughs> so, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, I try to do my best uh, and uh, using your help because uh, yesterday evening we asked you to, to give very uh, brief feedback and also uh, I, I appreciate or we appreciate if you will uh, click to a link I shared also in chat at the moment to get um, sort of general feedback for, for our conference. But uh, yeah, just... Uh, um, very, very general comments or, or ideas I, I would like to share and express uh, during our last uh, uh, half an hour, because I hope, I, I believe everybody of us would like to have some informal communication and go to the coffee room. <laughs> but... Um, uh, 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 as already uh, 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 Marco mentioned that uh, we have or had all together more than 200 participants and those countries were presented. So it's a very, very uh, rich uh, audience and, and uh, very, uh, very uh, nice contribution from different um, uh, areas from the world. But um, uh, the, one of the main messages what I got actually reading through your comments uh, or feedback uh, we got uh, yesterday evening and also during the discussions uh, uh, was that um, 
uh, we, we are in the middle of a learning and, uh, and the all systems, all schools, uh, not just adapting in new situation and trying to, to uh, cope or survive, but uh, we are actually uh, learning what is actually going on and how to, to be prepared for future. And uh, uh, the concept of re resilience is something uh, it, which is used in uh, rescue areas, but uh, also uh, more and more used in, uh, in, uh, during the turbulent times to, to understand how actually we can uh, uh, um, uh, be prepared uh, how to, uh, to use our previous developments uh, to adapt in new situations and then how uh, organizational procedures allow us to change our practices fast, how uh, flexible actually we are, how uh, well we actually uh, um, um, uh, cope what is actually uh, uh, happening around, but also at the same time, how well we actually monitor and uh, research our work and, and uh, uh, use this knowledge to improve accordingly. But basically, this is also learning situation and this is sort of learning cycle. Uh, we we uh, need to plan our future developments based on what we have experienced uh, uh, so far. And, uh, and maybe also one message uh, from Estonian perspective that uh, uh, there is no uh, solutions which uh, fits for all. What we also heard uh, several times uh, and, and uh, during several sessions uh, uh, during this conference. And for example, what we discovered that at least uh, there were like a sort of four types of schools uh, which uh, more or less uh, try to try to find ways how to uh, uh, work in uh, distance learning mode and how to plan their future developments there could be very strong teacher communities uh, working very closely uh, with schools or there could be uh, 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 very optimistic leaders and uh, some kind of uh, uh, collegial uh, culture be, uh, with a very limited enthusiasm to use technology, but they anyway coped very very well because they had very collegial and uh, and uh, and uh, supportive um, culture where teachers. Uh, uh, experienced uh, each other's uh, support or were, were very uh, technology friendly but uh, very individually coping uh, schools but they had quite uh, good feedback from parents and therefore they also managed uh, rather well but also there were sort of group of schools uh, with a laissez fear uh, culture, hoping that every, everything goes over and, and uh, the normal, normality somehow like um, comes back. So uh, the situation is very different among schools, among countries, among teachers, uh, communities, and therefore uh, this kind of learning cycle is the, the most crucial to, to, to find ways for future. But uh, and and also uh, from the yesterday's reflection, reflection, uh, several of you mentioned that uh, we should discuss further challenges of a distance uh, teaching, uh, but also advantages and disadvantages, and and uh, the action that have been implemented and what, uh, that uh, uh, should continue to promote after uh, crisis. Basically, what we can conclude that what are the implications for our future work? And um, I picked up uh, uh, these kind of four questions. First, are uh, implications for teaching and learning process, but uh, how to find ways for more flexible, personalized learning and uh, students' agency. 
But uh, uh, very cru crucially is how to support vulnerable uh, learners and deal with uh, inequality and consider individual needs of students and also taking care of well-being all uh, 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 participants, uh, students and teachers, and also implications for teacher education, uh, especially the sessions I participated uh, focused on uh, on initial teacher education. So. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, talking about uh, new opportunities for teaching and learning, um, social interaction and new ways of communication between all parties uh, were, uh, discussed and, uh, and, uh, and also researched by some of our colleagues and uh, uh, how to enrich or broaden our teaching approaches and pedagogical repertoire uh, at the university and also at schools. And uh, of course, uh, I guess that the awareness of new competencies required in future is quite explicit. Uh, for example, how to, to manage in uncertain situations and, and, uh, and cross-curricular competencies, which are obviously in, in every national curriculum already addressed for a long time, but the, uh, at least uh, our experience uh, is that uh, we are not very uh, experienced or we, we have lack of knowledge how to develop those uh, competencies and uh, agency of actors and, uh, and uh, this also means that uh, constant improvement of a system depends uh, pretty much how teachers take, take initiative in, in that process. Um, and uh, Talking about uh, flexibility uh, uh, of a learning process, and uh, I assume that uh, personalized learning uh, uh, also sort of mantra or message uh, uh, has been in, in several discussions for a long time, but uh, all we we didn't have so much uh, understanding how to uh, develop this, how to make more possibilities for uh, personalized learning or how to consider students' uh, individual needs and also uh, uh, the develop uh, students' competence of self-regulation. Because this is not uh, something uh, to take for granted. We need to de develop uh, students' uh, ability for self-regulation. So uh, obviously, this is one area in, in future we, we definitely need to consider not uh, to, to uh, uh, distance learning, but in very, uh, uh, um, uh, not very normal, there is no normal anymore, but <laughs> in, it is a natural part of a learning process and we, we should uh, uh, take it uh, uh, very, very seriously and, and find ways. And yeah, I, I would say that at least my personal experience working with uh, student teachers uh, and school leaders also uh, uh, is that uh, now I, I have much more uh, uh, knowledge or experience how to, to work on with uh, personalized uh, uh, learning. And uh, uh, about... Uh, uh, um, inequality and and uh, and uh, uh, students with different backgrounds and and uh, and special needs and uh, what actually came out from one presentation that uh, uh, online environment may be easier for students who feel very unsure but um, uh, we still need to consider how to keep social interaction uh, as uh, utmost uh, uh, aspect of uh, being human and, and acting in, in, in society. So, but uh, what I also would like to address that uh, uh, which maybe wasn't so explicit or presented in 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 presentations uh, during this conference, but uh, well-being uh, actually became or become even more crucial while we have lack of social interaction and uh, we can't like uh, uh, 
read each other's emotions and and how to to support and and consider if we see that somebody doesn't feel well for example and uh, and finally yes uh, uh, initial teach education and i was happy also chairing one very rich uh, session where we talked about uh, student teachers practicum especially but uh, but also there are uh, many other elements in initial teach education we need to consider further and uh, and think how to uh, improve our uh, teach education um, uh, programs and uh, uh, especially in blended uh, or hybrid learning uh, process, uh, uh, new competencies and roles are required uh, by teacher educators, but also uh, by students themselves and, and, and mentor teachers from schools, uh, for example. Uh, so uh, these are like uh, four main uh, sort of areas I'd like to uh, address or I picked up from your uh, reflections uh, and uh, from the sessions. And um, we, we still have some minutes uh, before we are going for our informal um, part. And please uh, uh, respond or, or comment what you'd like to address or, uh, or uh, take away. So are you waiting for coffee or you'd like to <laughs> interact? <laughs> Well, maybe one thing I realized that although you could say that the conference topic is a limited topic focused on distance learning, uh, I think the whole uh, period we've gone through uh, has shaken the fundamental elements of teacher education. Uh, so um, the, 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 maybe it was... It could be expected, but for me in some ways it's, it's surprising that um, uh, the, th the topics we discussed are fundamentally for teacher education. It's not just one part of teacher education or one perspective of teacher education, but it actually addresses the whole fundamental perspective on how do we see a teacher education, both in terms of contents and process and policy and politics. And, and I think that's, um, um, well, I think that that gives food for quite uh, a number of follow-up activities. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, Erika, could you somehow uh, reflect and the link uh, what we discussed or what I presented now and with uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Michael Apple, actually addressed uh, in the beginning of the conference? Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Erika Löfström, a TEPE board member, and uh, um, I'm at the University of Helsinki. Um, Eve asked me to, to prepare some ideas um, connecting to, to Professor Apple's uh, uh, keynote, and, and I, I, I prepared some, some thoughts um, um, related to, to uh, some of the sessions that I took part in and, and, and chaired myself. And um, in one of the sessions, uh, we focused on both a more theoretical and philosophical level of uh, on what happens with time and, and space in, in online teaching and, and what that looks like through an empirical lens. And the idea was presented that uh, school and being in class have shifted towards um, psychological entities. And, and we talked about that. And then the question was raised that how do professionals collectively come together to deal with this quotation, uh, earthquake, end of quotation. Uh, and um, uh, the discussion continued to, to the insight that um, uh, finding a consensus may not be possible, and I'm now meaning consensus in a, in a very broad sense, and this political tension and, and rhetorics uh, have also been highlighted in different uh, speeches, not least in, in Professor Apple's uh, uh, 
uh, speech. And I, I wanted to connect here to, to a concrete example shared with, uh, with us by, by Professor Apple. In this example, two groups of, of actors um, with very uh, different backgrounds and, and um, different uh, perhaps goals and aims mutually came together to solve a, a problem or challenge in the school environment that, that both groups thought that uh, uh, it, it is a problem that needs, needs to be addressed. And to me, this was a, a very powerful example of, of um, building trust, collaborating, working towards a bigger aim. Um, and the implication for teacher education is I think that we need to focus on collegial and professional collaboration with an emphasis on professional and collaboration. And what does that mean and how to implement that in practice without giving uh, into um, a kind of relativism that uh, uh, compromise the interests of, of those in, in the weaker position, namely, uh, at the end of the day, the pupils. So I think here teacher educators are also important role models. Uh, and we must ask ourselves that do we model these uh, uh, behaviors, trust building? Uh, do we model professionalism, reciprocity, an orientation towards collaboration also with those who do not think in the same way as we ourselves do? and ultimately agency. Do we model agent, agency as teacher educators? Um, so um, that was one, one of the things I, I picked up and, and, and a discussion that continued in, in, in one of the sessions that I chaired. And um, another message um, brought uh, forward by Professor Apple related to the gendered uh, issues and inequalities. And there was a very powerful example uh, uh, in Professor Apple's talk about girls uh, who did not drink water in 40 degrees Celsius heat because there were not the toilet facilities for, for them to be used. Uh, this is a very sad uh, example and, and true for many uh, pupils in the world. And uh, an example from a physical environment. Um, and of course, it's obvious that the online environment will solve some problems, but also it will not solve all problems. Uh, they just might look different. Um, and this is where I want to connect to one of the, the sessions um, uh, I shared, uh, shared this morning. Uh, we had examples, no, actually this was a session yesterday. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, there was an example of, of um, how teachers uh, through the re research initiative shared um, their observations uh, of uh, uh, what's happening with their pupils in the distance teaching. And um, there were uh, examples very, in a way similar to the ones that we heard to uh, uh, professor from Professor Apple's talk, uh, for instance, uh, how girls had to do household duties and take care of younger siblings in in during the school day. So their realistic chances of taking part in the uh, learning opportunities that the school offered were very limited. Uh, so essentially, this is very, very much still the same problem, but it just looks looks different. And, and at the root is, is uh, in inequality, and in this case, um, gender inequality. So the inequalities are there, uh, but they can be perhaps less obvious now uh, when we are at a distance. But an awareness of these and, and an understanding of the implications for the learning opportunities are, are uh, essential. Um, I lead a teacher education uh, program with a pronounced focus on diversity, multilingualism and social 
justice and I very much embrace, embrace the mission of teacher education, uh, changing the world uh, to become a better place for those who are disadvantaged. Uh, and I say this even at, at um, the risk of, of sounding uh, naive, uh, realizing that I come from a privileged region in terms of socioeconomic factors and, and education. Uh, the fact remains that inequalities are still there locally and, and globally, uh, but some just perhaps less obvious or, or less tangible. Uh, so teacher education uh, must continue to emphasize an awareness of, of these and an understanding of the implications uh, for learning and, and for society at large. And it's easy to become discouraged at the face of of the magnitude of, of some of these issues. But I think uh, this brings me back to the uh, uh, notion of agency and, and also the notion of mission and their importance in, in teacher education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Erika. And um, uh, I would continue uh, from this point, uh, emphasizing what is said already also several times. And uh, today's morning session, we actually already started to find opportunities for joint act activities, uh, research activities in future, because uh, although we experience uh, this situation very differently, but uh, evidences, research evidences are very crucial to take next steps and to really to understand influence and, uh, and uh, benefits and, uh, and understand the challenges, uh, whatever we are planning or what uh, we are considering to, to take as uh, development uh, steps. But uh, what also uh, somehow surprised me a lot uh, how teacher educators became or become action researchers because uh, several of papers uh, which were presented during this conference actually were about our own practices to understand what we should improve in our teacher education programs and uh, this is really uh, inspiring and, and uh, uh, promising <laughs> regarding uh, uh, future perspectives in teacher education. And same uh, also happening actually with teachers at schools. Unfortunately, we didn't have so, so many teachers ac uh, in service or uh, active teachers in our conference presenting their uh, piece of research, but uh, uh, probably many of us know that uh, this is what is also happening at, at schools. And... Uh, what, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. one more minute. <laughs> As Tepe Network, we also have planned already some uh, next initiatives. And uh, already in September, we have planned webinars. So probably some of us could uh, comment this very briefly. Uh, Björn or Marco? Or... Björn, can you, could you highlight the uh, ideas? Bjorn, your microphone is still off. Sorry. One of the experiences during last uh, years has been the increased importance of building uh, systematically career ways, pathways for teachers. And the, the, it sort of addresses question both of teacher shortage, but also of teacher quality. And we we have seen the emergence of different models for that and we would like to look into into those models and and deepen the analysis of of how that could contribute and how that also affects how we understand teacher education mm -hmm. thank you yeah thank you thank you very much and um as uh, we asked or shared already information about our new web page uh, definitely the webinar information will be available there 
but uh, of course we will uh, share the information via our uh, network and uh, once again i am asking you to to give feedback for us and also address which could be possible uh, themes uh, the network could deal in in future and um, and um, Probably now is time to really say huge thanks for our organizers. Uh, starting from uh, Professor Pavel Skaga, applause. <laughs> and the uh, entire team from uh, University of Ljubljana, Janes Greg, Janes Vogrings, and Igor Repak, and uh, all uh, others who actually assisted us during this uh, uh, Zoom conference, uh, breakout rooms and uh, backup rooms. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I already smell uh, uh, fruits and, and feel how we could uh, have an informal discussion and, and uh, talk about possible future plans. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is not reality at the moment, although I am vaccinating and I can travel around already, <laughs> but probably this happens uh, next, uh, next uh, year. But uh, Janes, uh, please, uh, you raised the hand and probably would like to say a few words. Yes, uh, thank you, Eve. Uh, I would just like to say some uh, four farewell words uh, at, at the end of this conference uh, in the name of the organizers. Uh, so first, thank you for uh, uh, the, the previous warm words. Um, I would, um, <clears throat> of course, like to thank you first uh, all to all the participants uh, who took part at this conference to be here with us and of course to the members of the TEPE board uh, which has trusted us uh, the organization of this conference uh, this somehow anniversary year uh, for the TEPE. Um, <clears throat> we were uh, of course very uh, <clears throat> glad that we could take this uh, job and uh, but we would certainly be more satisfied that uh, you could all visit Ljubljana in uh, reality. Uh, however, also in this distant way, I believe that uh, the conference has achieved its goal, uh, goals and uh, that we could uh, have an interesting, active conference with uh, interactive en encounters and discussions and it was also um, in, in content, uh, current and up to date, uh, in my belief. So um, at the end, I would say that we hope that uh, the participants are satisfied with the organization, uh, that at least we could say that the technical uh, part did not collapse or <laughs> it did yeah. function. Uh, <clears throat> So thank you uh, to all for all your inputs. And uh, I would like to thank again to our uh, colleague, Professor Apple, for a very much inspiring keynote speech, uh, which set the tone uh, for the conference. So uh, from our part, I would like to say again, uh, goodbye and uh, best regards for to all. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, now it's really time for uh, informal talk. And uh, I would like to ask uh, at least Tepe board members to stay for a while to, 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 to have some final reflection together. Is it okay for you? And uh, um, I stop the sharing the screen and now we can really wave to each other and uh, give huge thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>